Today, I would like to discuss our broader response to the coronavirus in Illinois. In every step that we take, our priority is getting ahead and staying ahead in our response, and doing so with the safety of our most vulnerable residents at the core of our preparedness. That is why today, in the next phase of our continued effort to stay ahead of these changing circumstances, I am formally announcing a disaster proclamation for Illinois, our version of a state of emergency. There have been 13 other states across the nation that have taken this step, and I want to reiterate that a disaster proclamation is an operational procedure that opens up a substantial set of federal and state resources and tools. It allows our state disaster relief fund to cover the costs related to our preparations and our response. And when the White House turns on the Stafford Act, as we expect, this act qualifies Illinois for federal reimbursement dollars from this point forward. This proclamation also enhances our existing staff on the ground. It allows us to assemble and to deploy mobile support teams of first responders and public health officials to address new issues as they arise. And it allows us to request additional medical experts and on the ground support from federal agencies like the CDC and FEMA. This declaration also reduces red tape across state government so that moving forward, we will have all the tools in play and rapidly available to deploy to assist cities and counties across Illinois. It strengthens the ability of IEMA and IDPH to coordinate state resources through the activation of the State Emergency Operations Center, which provides decision makers from every state agency with more formal roles in the deployment of our resources to address coronavirus. Already, we have an interagency strategic planning cell dedicated to ensuring our emergency plans are up to date. The Operations Center fortifies that work. To be clear, this declaration will build on an already robust response that has been developed over many months and is well underway. We have one of the strongest public health systems in the nation, and we were among the first states able to test for COVID-19 because we knew to press for that capability. And now we have three testing labs in Chicago, in Springfield, and in Carbondale, all with the ability to run tests. These state labs meet our current need, and we anticipate commercial expansion this week to meet demand for widespread testing. Additionally, to gather more data about the state of COVID-19 in Illinois and in the United States, we are now running voluntary surveillance testing at 15 hospitals statewide, seven hospitals in Cook County, three hospitals in other areas of Northern Illinois, three hospitals in Central Illinois, and two hospitals in Southern Illinois to monitor the presence of the virus in our communities. I want to emphasize that this is a statewide response with robust preparations and deployment of resources in southern, central, and northern Illinois. In a few moments, the experts standing with me today will further elaborate on the preparations that we're taking at the federal, state, county, and local levels, as well as reiterate what the general public should be doing. But I want to leave you with a few final thoughts. I know that this is a difficult time for people as we try to understand and respond to something this new. It's reasonable to feel apprehension. I want folks to understand this is going to affect your daily life. But know that your city, your county, and your state officials are working hard to stay ahead of this and to give you all the facts as soon as we know them. Starting tomorrow, my administration will begin offering a daily press conference on the current state of our response to COVID-19. We will continue to communicate with you regularly, responsibly, and honestly as we move forward. Remember that 
there are things that you can do to help yourselves, your family, and your community. As your governor, I'm asking you to do them. If you think you might be sick, please take no risks that could endanger others in the community. Call a health care provider first and plan to have a visit to your doctor if you're experiencing any symptoms. If you're being asked to self-isolate, please follow the instructions given to you. Breaking isolation puts others at risk. Call elderly relatives, friends, and neighbors. Make sure that they have the supplies that they need and someone to contact in case of an emergency. Do not hoard supplies or seek to purchase healthcare equipment like masks that are not being recommended by public health officials. You are keeping supplies from the healthcare workers who need them. Educate yourself about what's going on every day and what precautions we're asking everyone to take. Make good decisions about travel and attending public events. Most of all, remember that we are one community here in Illinois and community members take care of each other. Don't let fear replace level-headedness. You have responsibilities during this crisis too, and it's important to live up to them. I'll leave you with the words of the late Mr. Rogers, who had a way of handling all things with a calm empathy. He said, look for helpers. There are always people who are helping. So look for the helpers. They are everywhere right now. And be a helper. We need more of them at the moment. Thank you all, and now I'd like to turn it over to Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What is this? Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Governor Pritzker and his team for their leadership on this issue. I'd like to thank our counterparts at the City of Chicago and DuPage County. Our collaboration is vital as we work to minimize the impact of COVID-19 and ensure the health and well-being of our residents and visitors. I want to acknowledge Dr. Terry Mason, who's head of our Cook County Department of Public Health. Here in Cook County, we're also issuing a declaration to ensure that we maximize the funding and resource opportunities available to our public health leaders as well as our municipalities. These declarations are proactive we will position the county and our municipal and state partners to ensure that our timely and forward-leaning response efforts continue. This will enhance our ability to assess and access resources, equipment, and personnel needed to address the circumstances on the ground. These declarations will also allow for greater collaboration with municipal, state, and federal partners positioning us to access funding and support from the federal government when additional resources are necessary and funding is made available. We're working together to take these steps because we want to remain proactive to contain the spread of this virus. I want to urge our residents and our communities to stay calm and heed the recommendations and guidance provided by the Cook County Department of Public Health as well as the Chicago and Illinois Departments of Public Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to thank my staff and our health care workers on the front lines who have worked tirelessly to properly screen and manage potential and confirmed cases. They've demonstrated a dedication and diligence since the first case was identified in Cook County. Now I'd like to welcome my friend, DuPage County Chairman, Dan Cronin to make remarks. Thank you, thank you, President Preckwinkle. Um, yes, I'm um, I'm pleased to to be here today with the governor, President Preckwinkle, other public officials. Um, today we stand with the governor, as he has acted to better prepare our state for the next phase of our response to COVID-19. While the risk to Illinoisans remains low, the governor's declaration provides an avenue for state and local governments to access federal funding 
for our planning and our response efforts. It also allows the state to better assist the county and local governments and to procure emergency supplies and equipment if needed. Uh, every day, the DuPage County Health Department, headed up by uh, Karen Ayala, who's here, our Director of Public Health in DuPage County, uh, and our Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, work together to keep our communities safe uh, from the spread of infectious disease. We've been through this before. Uh, the DuPage County, DuPage County Health Department staff experts have been working tirelessly since January to investigate potential cases of disease and to quickly contain the spread of novel of this novel coronavirus. I want to recognize our healthcare partners and hospitals who continue to work around the clock to respond to this disease. As we enter the next phase of our response, it will be critical, critical for us to work together to minimize the disruption to our social, economic, and healthcare environments. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to the director from Chicago Public Health, Dr. Elwoody. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Allison Arwady. I'm the commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, I'm here representing Mayor Lightfoot and the city of Chicago. Uh, you've already heard me speak a lot about our preparedness work here in Chicago, uh, across the county, across the state, um, and certainly this is another piece of looking ahead and being prepared. I've been in constant communication with the mayor, and I am here to announce that the Chicago Department of Public Health and the Illinois Department of Public Health have identified four more cases of COVID-19 in Chicago. You heard the governor already reference this, and I want to thank him for his leadership uh, on this issue, as I want to thank the mayor. So two of these cases, a woman in her 50s and a woman in her 70s are both family members of the sixth case that we announced on Friday. That's the woman who acquired the virus on a cruise and who is an employee at a Chicago high school. Neither of the other women, the, the newly diagnosed cases, are employees or are associated with the school. The third new case is a woman in her 50s from California who traveled to Illinois. And the fourth most recent case is a woman in her 70s who returned earlier this month from an Egyptian cruise that has been linked to COVID-19 cases. All four of these new cases are currently in good condition. We said all along that we anticipated more positive cases, so I do want to be clear that this news is not surprising. In fact, in many ways, it is an example of the public health system working as it should. We were able to quickly identify these new cases and act on the information by ensuring that these individuals received the medical care that they need and were properly isolated to prevent further possible spread of the virus. The investigation by the Chicago Department of Public Health, the Illinois Department of Public Health, and the CDC into these and other cases is ongoing even as we look ahead and prepare for our broader response to COVID-19. I'd like to reassure people that these two new cases associated with the employee at Vaughn High School highlight what we know about this virus and particularly that close contacts to confirmed cases are the ones most at risk, like the family members in this case. We recognize that this may raise concern um, among the high school community, but to date, there is not sign of transmission at the school. Testing is ongoing of students and staff who have shown symptoms. That's a protocol that's guided by the scientific evidence. Although more lab tests are pending, at this point, the tests that have returned on students and staff have been negative, and that includes people who visited local emergency departments on their own for testing, as well as those who have been tested as part of the process that CDPH and Chicago Public Schools have established. CDPH and CPS have been reaching out to all of the families and staff from this school um, on an individual basis. We've not identified anyone who is seriously ill at this point, and we are in the middle of our ongoing process. We really appreciate the cooperation um, of the community with this. Obviously, this school um, is a population of students with special needs, so our response has been particularly robust. 
And as always, we will be providing updates um, if we have new confirmed cases. Uh, and I'd like you to know that the confirmed case related to the school remains in good condition. We continue to get a lot of questions about the testing process. Um, and I wanted to explain that really following what we know about this virus, we are testing people who are symptomatic, who have symptoms like fever, cough, and shortness of breath, because they are the people for whom the virus is active enough to show up on a test. Those who do not have symptoms either do not have the virus or have it at such low levels that it would not register. This is why we monitor people for 14 days after their last exposure to a confirmed case. And if they develop symptoms at any point during that 14-day period, we test them um, at that point, and we will do the same in this investigation. Testing asymptomatic people would not be helpful and could result in false negatives, as in someone could have low levels of the virus, but they're not yet coughing, they're not yet spreading it, they could test negative and later get sick. So I just want to emphasize that as always, we are following the science on this. And also, the vast majority of cases, I'll remind you that, that this virus has been spread by symptomatic individuals. This is not like measles, where it is airborne, and even people who are not close contacts can be easily infected. COVID-19 is spread via close contact, defined as someone who was within six feet of a confirmed case for 10 minutes. It is spread via droplets, as in coughs and sneezes, and this close contact is vital. Community spread is being detected in a growing number of communities and in parts of the United States. For weeks, we have been preparing not just as Chicago, but as a whole region and state to be ready for local person-to-person -person spread. And as we enhance our surveillance efforts and begin testing more people, we expect to see more cases. I do want to take a brief moment to thank our many partners, including our hospitals and healthcare institutions, who have already been vital in this response and will remain vital. Uh, we all have a role to play, as you heard the governor delineate. We will continue to update the public. I'll next introduce, um, excuse me, uh, Dr. Ngazi Azike, who is the director of the Illinois Department of Public Health. We've been working together many times a day. I'll introduce you to her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Arwadi. So as has been mentioned, we now have 11 cases of the COVID-19 here in Illinois, and it's possible that we will get more. Again, all of these four cases have a direct connection, uh, either to a confirmed case or a high-risk activity coming back from a high, a high community transmission area. Uh, cruises we now know are a high a high risk, and the State Department is recommending that Americans uh, avoid cruises. To date, there has only been one individual of our 11 confirmed cases who we know acquired, who we know acquired the virus from within the community. So from that, we deduce that the virus is not circulating widely in the community at this time. But we must prepare for the eventual spread into our communities. And so that's where the preparedness and planning comes in. Our three IDPH laboratories continue to perform testing for COVID-19 statewide, both for the individuals who are part of the case investigations, as well as samples from the surveillance hospitals that you heard the governor reference. Again, sentinel surveillance involves specimens that have tested negative for flu and that are sent from one of the participating hospitals to the IDPH lab to test for COVID. So far, we've tested upwards of uh, 80 samples and have not had a positive from within those. That surveillance testing will continue. Overall, we've tested 600 plus specimens and of those have come up with 11, 11 positives. We have received additional reagents and test kits uh, from the CDC and we're still requesting more. And as you are aware, there are some commercial labs that have come online with this that will assist in this important effort as well. I do want to encourage people to start planning now for what could be if the situation expands. Again, we just rather prepare in advance 
as opposed to be caught being caught flat-footed. So we want people to start thinking of a situation potentially where you have to uh, travel, um, where you have to commute uh, by an alternate method than the methods you use now. Where if your child's school closed and you still had to work, what would be your situation? If you are sick and can't go to work, um, what arranging with your employer, the leave, the time off. Uh, if you're planning a large event, thinking of what would have to be done, should it have to be postponed? Again, these are just things that we want people to be thinking through as preparedness and not that those things are all being recommended now. Resources to help you plan out these what ifs uh, can be found on the IDPH website at dph.illinois.gov. As the governor said, the state of Illinois will continue to use every resource and every tool at its disposal to respond to this situation. We will work in lockstep with our local health department and our partners throughout the communities. We will continue to be transparent and open and share any positive results as they come up. And in the meantime, we recommend the continued practice of everyday common sense health actions to help becoming to help prevent becoming ill and help prevent the spread of germs. Again, staying home while you're ill, disinfecting commonly touched surfaces, um, coughing into a napkin, uh, all of those measures will help prevent the spread of germs, coronavirus and other germs, influenza. If you haven't had your influenza shot, again, it's an important action that we are still recommending. We want to decrease the disease burden in our state. Uh, the less people that have flu, the more resources we will have available for people if they develop the COVID-19 infection. So please continue to follow these important messages uh, and we will all be better as a result. And with that, I will now turn it over to General Tate Nadeau. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Azike. The governor's gubernatorial proclamation puts the full weight of his administration behind the state's response to COVID-19. The State Emergency Operations Center is currently coordinating with key state agencies and federal partners, engaging with our local network of emergency managers, health departments, and elected officials. This allows us to engage with over 56 state agencies and mutual aid partners. IAMA is currently working directly with our robust mutual aid network, including the Mutual Aid Box Alarm System, Illinois Law Enforcement Agency, Illinois Medical Emergency Response Teams, and the Illinois Emergency Services Management Association and Illinois Public Works Mutual Aid Network. Our whole government approach allows the state to activate mobile support teams, call on personnel who may have medical backgrounds, such as nurses in schools. We know that many communities have been taxed since mid-February and some of them earlier. So identifying additional resources will be key in our response. A disaster proclamation also allows us to expedite the purchasing of supplies and other resources needed by our local governments and state agencies. Another key point to this proclamation also allows the agencies to draw on the state's disaster response recovery fund, which is used to pay for emergency purchases and personnel. Additionally, it allows for potential reimbursement at the state and local level. Currently funding is being provided through health and human services through public health. As it stands, Illinois Emergency Management has representatives embedded in the city of Chicago, Cook County, and O'Hare National Airport to ensure real-time information sharing and coordination response. A state disaster proclamation allows the state to ask the federal government for additional resources should the need arise. We have already tapped into and requested through the strategic national stockpile to ensure that we have full equip for over 600,000 N95 masks and 1.2 million gloves and additional personal protective equipment. We have also assembled subject matter experts from throughout the state to focus on significant issues that could arise as we move forward, especially legal authorities, joint information, school health and safety, and the delivery of essential government services. 
IEMA is working with our counties and local jurisdictions to enhance their emergency operations plans to address unusual needs associated with this event. This includes identifying resources needed to respond as well as complementing and supplementing emergency management resources at the local level, working very closely with public health. But I also remind the public that they play an important role in supporting our efforts to contain the spread of the virus. As you have mentioned before, there are simple things that you can do. If you cough, cover your mouth, wash your hands frequently, and go back, and if you are sick, do not go to work or to school, and make educated decisions about attending hosting large gatherings. Follow CDC guidelines and advise your local, state, and public health officials. Make decisions based on fact, not fear. This is a common sense health guidance that we have been utilizing for years, and there is no reason to stop now. At this time, I would like to invite Governor Pritzker to come back, and we will answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Just before I take questions, I just want to say um, I want to thank the officials from Cook County, uh, from DuPage County, uh, and all of the people who work with them uh, who have been on the case here uh, consistently, uh, along with the mayor of Chicago, who's, who may not have been able to join us today, but I was on the phone with her just a little while ago, um, and of course, Dr. Arwoody representing the city. Uh, I also want to say we have 100 other counties in the state of Illinois, and we have been in contact with those counties, are continuing to communicate with them and with the mayors of cities across the state. Um, it's important that we uh, communicate regularly with them uh, and with all of you and with the public, and we'll continue to do that. Our daily press briefings will help with that. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. I have a couple questions. First, before you take your debt, um, is there any additional quarantine scenario with anybody outside or do you see them still in the cases? Are there family members here that may or may not be well, there are, there are because there are people who they've come in contact with, obviously, and so we've asked a number of them to, to uh, impose self-isolation, um, and many of them have been uh, evaluated, and uh, some of them have been tested themselves, but I'd like to turn it over to, yeah, Dr. Arwoody. Sure. Yeah, yeah, so as always, when we have a confirmed case of coronavirus, uh, we're looking for people who were close contacts of that individual, um, and we are encouraging them to, you know, to, to self-quarantine. In the case, for example, of the school, where we had a lot of individuals who were high risk, we made a very broad recommendation um, around that self-isolation, but in all of these cases, and for every case, this is what the health departments do. We look at who is around these individuals, we have them isolate, we monitor them for 14 days, we test them where it's indicated. When we define another case, we go from there. Yeah, so so thank you for that question because we, we often will will get questions like this. Um, Close contact with a confirmed case is what is considered need for self-isolation. It doesn't continue to go out step by step by step from there. So if we have, for example, um, uh, the, the new cases that we've identified, um, we will be working with their places of work uh, to make sure if there are people who were in close contact with them, that they're following them, et cetera. Um, but we would not be requiring that whole place of work to self-isolate, for example. Does that make sense? I have a follow-up question that's yep. related to the ID store. Um, there's legislation that has been um, introduced on Capitol Hill that would require all employers to provide at least seven days of grace for food to everybody, including paycheck to paycheck workers, and 14 additional days to indicate in a food type of public health emergency. What are your thoughts on that? And is that a conversation you are having with anyone at the state level? Should quarantine Yeah, that's, uh, first of all, I am very concerned about many people who either have to self-isolate um, or have become ill uh, and who have to take lots of time off work. 14 days is a long time for many people who live paycheck to paycheck. Um, and so we're at the state level, we're looking at our unemployment insurance. 
to see how we can expand it on our own uh, because it will take the federal government. It seems like the federal government takes a long time to do nearly anything these days. Um, and so I, you know, I'm not anticipating that that's going to happen in short order. So we're looking at ways that we can alleviate the burden on those folks right now. The other thing, of course, I just want to add is, you know, health coverage, right? There are many people who are underinsured or maybe insured, but don't know whether they're insured for this. And as you know, I've been in regular contact with uh, the senior people at the major insurance companies in Illinois. Um, all of them now, the, the major ones, have uh, agreed to cover uh, testing and, you know, the care right around that testing. Um, and that's good. Uh, we're going to need more. You know, we want to make sure that everybody knows that they are covered and that if you're not feeling well, you should reach out to your, you should call your health care provider um, and talk to them first and then perhaps go in and see them, but not with any fear, don't have any fear that you will be covered for that and for the test that might result. Yeah, there are three specimens per person that gets tested. And I'd ask Dr. Azika to join us because um, we the three labs, which are state labs, are under her jurisdiction. So it can range anywhere from uh, one to three. So uh, without having the exact number, some people only had one, some people had two, but some people had three. So it's on the order of probably about 200 to plus people, um, but we can get those numbers to you. how many specimens that we can run, yeah. yeah. So we think for the current cases that we're looking into and the, the, the PUIs that may come out of that, we are covered. Mm -hmm. But we're also doing, oh, the person's under investigation. So if any of the people that we are following develop fever or respiratory symptoms, that that would be the trigger to test them. But we're also doing the sentinel surveillance where we're looking for people who are not connected to a case, you know, not connected to travel at one of the level three or two or not from a cruise. Um, we're also trying to test some of those people. And so that's where um, these partnership with the commercial labs will be very helpful. Uh, I've been already on conversations with some of the uh, medical directors from some of these commercial lab companies. And so we are working through how we can coordinate, you know, public-private partnerships in terms of making sure that more people are tested beyond what the capacity is at the public health lab while we're still waiting for CDC to send additional reagents and while we're also working on the development of our own test. Are you out of reagents right now? We're not out of reagents at this time. You talk about the person who was reported to have been on a train. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Does anybody? So, you know, so that's being handled by uh, Missouri. Is anyone in Illinois? Because there's reports that she stayed with a friend here in Chicago. Yeah. So the Missouri Department of Public Health or whichever the local um, local health department would be reaching out to all those appropriate contacts, and they will um, be able to give those exact numbers. But those that information will be put into our registry uh, at some point, and so we would be able to know who those persons are. And I would just point out to your question earlier, there's on the website at dph.illinois.gov, uh, we have a running tally of PUIs uh, and the number of people who have been confirmed to have coronavirus and those who are in process of, they've received a preliminary reading of positive, but we've sent the test to CDC for confirmation. So you can see all of that, the statistics of it are being updated, I think three times a week. So we have Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You know, there there have been uh, uh, information um, issuances from the CDC about um, who uh, should stay home, perhaps not attend these m major events. Um, it's mostly been about the elderly, people who have uh, either an underlying condition or are over a certain age. And so if you go to the cdc.gov website or to the dph.illinois.gov dph.illinois.gov website, um, you can find the information about the advisories that are out there about whether or not you should travel, whether or not you just heard the uh, Dr. Azike talk about uh, people are being advised not to get on a cruise ship. 
Um, and uh, there's been, you know, discussion about um, older people um, traveling and those advisories are on the websites and, and available and get updated because to be frank with you, not everything is known yet, as I think you all know. Um, even the CDC is updating its own information. And so we're following very closely uh, what the experts are telling us, not just at the CDC, but here in the state of Illinois. But we'll keep on updating as we learn more. Governor, is there a consequence for violating, sorry, is it these last most recent cases that prompted you to issue this declaration? Or is this a constant weighing of, 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 of facts and you know, we've been in preparation for some time to, you know, fr from from way back at the very beginning, in fact, before the beginning of the coronavirus, uh, we were preparing for a situation of an outbreak. Uh, when the coronavirus came about, we've been monitoring closely, but we've been ahead of it, I think, at each moment. Uh, and so you've seen us make preparations and, and announce many of those preparations along the way. This is really more of that. It's staying ahead of it, making sure that, you know, as the other states have announced a disaster proclamation or a state of emergency, it allows them to access resources that we haven't yet uh, gotten in line to access. And I just, because we didn't need it at the moment, and that's the prudent thing to do, but we don't need it now, but we may need it in the near future. What we need now is to make sure that we have access to the resources because we can see from the other states, from the other countries, what's coming. You know, there's going to be an increase in cases. Uh, we want to care for those people uh, in every way we can. It's my job to, you know, to protect people, their health and their safety. And so it, I felt like not just the four cases over the weekend, but just the, the general trend of cases across the United States, uh, it seemed incumbent upon me to step forward now and have Illinois do everything we can. Well, right now, uh, the very first thing that we'll do is, and you heard it from uh, General Tate Nadeau, uh, we'll, we're going to distribute the hundreds of thousands of masks and other PPE, as they call it, personal protective equipment, to healthcare facilities and others around the state, just to make sure it's in place. It isn't like it's needed today. Um, we want to just make sure it's there. And when, it, when it's needed, it will be on site and ready to go. So that's just one thing that we'll be doing. Um, another, of course, is accessing uh, personnel from the CDC and from elsewhere to be able to bring them in if we need more personnel. We're very, being very protective of our nursing homes and our uh, veterans' homes. Uh, extra careful because, of course, these are, you know, older people who are in close proximity and we've seen in other states there have been challenges there. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that we do everything we can. So this, this proclamation really allows us to get ahead of that. Governor, but is there a consequence for violating the self-quarantine order and if not, what measures or efforts are you taking why not take that well, you heard me say earlier, I mean, people are breaching their duty to their communities when they do that. Um, th there is no legal consequence today, um, but I will say that I, I think people know what they should be doing. And, you know, we will be, uh, all of us, I think, on the lookout for people that, you know, that, that should be self-quarantining, self-isolating, uh, and aren't. But to be honest with you, people have been very cooperative in this. Um, Illinois is a special place in that way. People are very decent and honest and honorable. I've seen a lot of that across our state, and so, so far people are doing the right thing. Governor, are there any specific measures being taken to help people in concentrated populations like nursing homes, jails, or prisons? And then also for Dr. Arwadi, are there any discussions around canceling the St. Patrick's Day celebrations right now? So um, let me call on Dr. Azike first just to answer your first question about nursing homes. So that's a great question, and of course, that's very top of mind in terms of our elderly, uh, maybe have multiple medical conditions, and that population. So we have been working specifically on that, and actually we had a uh, conference call today that's going to be followed up by a webinar on Thursday where we were talking with nursing home and assisted care living um, administrators throughout the state. Uh, 
telling them that we want heightened uh, screening for the, for the staff that's coming in. Um, there's going to be pre-shift assessments where we're ensuring that the staff coming in is you know, fever-free, is not coming from a high-risk location in the last 14 days, that they're not having shortness of breath or respiratory symptoms, that they have not been told to be on home isolation. We're also looking to just decrease the burden of disease that might be coming into these facilities. So we've also asked that the children under 18, again, children under 18 don't necessarily have a direct connection to coronavirus, but they do still carry flu and all these other respiratory viruses that are very prevalent this time of the year. So we just want to decrease the burden of disease. Again, if we can decrease one case of flu, uh, that might be a, a hospital bed that could be used for COVID should we need it. So those uh, Conversations just um, happened today to have people step up their vigilance and be careful, um, limiting visitors uh, so that we can make sure that we are not uh, walking in viruses into a setting, a very tight and closed setting uh, with a very, very vulnerable population. Thank you. Um, so certainly the conversation about large gatherings um, has been an ongoing conversation and will continue to be. Um, at this point, uh, there has not been a decision to cancel uh, large mass gatherings. We are talking literally every day uh, to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, as we are looking at what our local epidemiology, what our cases look like as we're learning more about it and thinking about looking ahead as a community. Um, I do think that for people who are older, um, people who are older over 60, people who have underlying medical conditions, uh, we will be recommending that they avoid large mass gatherings. But we have not made a recommendation at this point. We'll be talking with the mayor, the whole team, the folks at the Office of Emergency Management and Communication, um, and we'll be quick to uh, communicate any necessary updates to that. Uh, case number seven um, is in serious condition. Um, he's hospitalized, uh, and our thoughts are certainly with him uh, and with his family. Yep. So uh, I have asked the uh, clerk of uh, Adams County, just to give you one example, uh, where Quincy is, uh, that we move the um, the polling station that is at the Quincy Veterans Home outside of the Quincy Veterans Home because the public is, it would be entering the home uh, in order to vote uh, and interacting with the veterans in that home uh, and their families. And, and these are folks who not only meet the criteria of being older and in the, um, you know, the category that Dr. Arwady uh, talked about, but also may have underlying conditions. So we want to protect them as best we can. We also want everybody to vote. Uh, and so we're making sure that the uh, clerk uh, we're asking the clerk in uh, Adams County to try to arrange a separate location, one that uh, either we would have one in the in the veterans' home that the veterans and their families might vote at and another for people in the area to vote at just to keep them separate or um, some other arrangement. But that's an example of the kind of thing we're certainly talking to the boards of elections of the state as well as the city. Uh, and the county uh, to make sure that they're looking out for, you know, election judges. We want to make sure we have enough election judges and that people know that it's safe to come and use a voting machine and to uh, to vote next Tuesday, a week from Tuesday. Last question. Are there any resources available for those who are for example, handymaids that are self-employed or those who have maybe some other skills that are needed? Yeah. So um, this is of grave concern to us as well. Um, we obviously people have available to them the ability to call an emergency room and to 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 go to an emergency room. But um, for those who don't have uh, some regular uh, type of health care, um, they should contact. They can reach out to our IDPH. Uh, that, that's at dph.illinois.gov. Uh, to access resources that would be of assistance to them in both getting tested. You know, we want people to start with testing for the flu and other viruses. Um, and then, you know, if need be, we would, of course, move on to the other kind of testing but uh, for, for coronavirus. But, um, but it is of grave concern to us. It's, you know, the, the, the challenge is, fortunately, this has not been widespread um, in, in terms of the number of people who have coronavirus so far in Illinois. But, um, but 
you know, we anticipate that there will be more people and these situations will arise. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.